ओम ज्ञान ज्ञानाजनिशलाकाय चक्षुर्मिलत तस्म श्रीगुरव नम नम ओं विष्णुपदा कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्यदेशिणे वाचाकूढ़ कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवभ्यो नमो नम श्रीकृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गाधार श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्ण हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा happy to be here with all of you it's it's uh, laudable that there is a excellent devotee care initiative happening here and i'm happy to be a part of it and uh, i'll speak about the bhagavad gita from the perspective of how it is related with our health i'll connect with those aspects of the gita's teachings which uh, relate with the concept of care and health so now generally when we use the word health in sanskrit the word is swasthya swasthya or swastha now this comes from the sanskrit sw this comes from the sanskrit sw Asthita. So, sthita is situation, and swa asthita means situated in one's own situation. So, swa one's own to. So, when is one healthy? When one we are in our own situation. So, in one sense, the key to health. and then ultimately towards uh, the so health means to be situated in our own situation and care is that which enables us to move towards health care promotes health so for example the health care specifically which refers to generally refers to physical health care you can have mental health care but in general the idea of care is meant to promote health it's like parents take care of children and a basic level of taking care of children is that the children are healthy so now in the bhagavad gita itself we start if we consider the 18 chapters of the gita the one is only brighter than the other nay adi brighter divi paathavi in kotta replace this can you please make it da manchi energy efficient ah yeah entha ni mottam cheyadaniki so if you see the start of the gita especially around 128 to 30 arjuna is exhibiting symptoms of breakdown it is basically an emotional and even a physical breakdown physical breakdown is he is saying that i can't i can't hold on to my bow and arrow bow primarily gandivam samsate hastad tok chaiya chaiva paridhayate is saying that my skin is burning what does this indicate if i consider the body to be like a tool there's something seriously wrong with it it's not functioning and then in 1873 arjuna says that sitosmi gata sandeha he says i am peacefully situated now so in one sense the gita restores arjuna's functionality arjuna has become emotionally and physically dysfunctional but by hearing the gita's message he says sthito now the word sthito asmi 
स्थितो इज रिलेटेड विद स्व आस्थित स्थित आई एम वेल सिचुएटेड आई एम सेल्फ सिचुएटेड आई एम स्व अस्थ तो गीता इन वन से गीता जर्नी इट रिस्टोर अर्जुन हेल्थ हेल्थ इन द सेंस ऑफ स्वस्थ इट रिस्टोर अर्जुन इमोशनल फिजिकल वी कैन से द फिजिकल हेल्थ और ही डिट सिकनेस ओवर देर बट फिजिकल हेल्थ वॉज अ रिजल्ट ऑफ अ ब्रेक डाउन समटाइम्स अर्जुन इनिशियल सिम्टम्स कैन चैप्टर वन सिम्टम्स कैन बी कंपेयर विथ स्ट्रेस and well that is true we often think of stress as being caused by having too many things to do and yes that is true at one level that if you have too many things to do it causes stress but what causes even more stress is actually having too many difficult decisions to make say if we have we have a very busy week we have 100 things to do and then that can cause a stress but then that is not that difficult okay we just decide this i can do this i have to delegate to someone else this i have to delay or delay or postpone and nobody expects us to do to be at two places at the same time so we understand so too many things to do that stress is manageable but too many difficult decisions to make so suppose we have to make a decision Now, should I relocate from this city to that city? Okay, then if I look, should I take a house here or there? Should I put my children in this school or that school? You know, should I have this size house or that size house? Now, when all this, all these decisions are to be made, each of these decisions is an important decision. And in these kind of decisions, it's rare that it's like we have a clear, rarely clear that this is the this is a right decision and this is a wrong decision. it's more like maybe this is a good decision and that is a better decision or sometimes it's like this is a bad decision that is a worse decision so when we say difficult decisions that means a decision is relatively easy if it is good and good versus bad then it's not a difficult decision a difficult decision is versus it's good versus better and we are unable to decide which is good versus better or sometimes it is bad versus worse that means sometimes we are in a bad situation say we just lost a job and that is itself and we are in a vulnerable situation we have to take another job maybe it's not the kind of job we would like to take but we have to so it's a it's which is the less worse situation so when we have this kind of difficult decisions to make that is when we get overworked mentally so arjuna was faced with such a difficult decision he had a dharma samoha he had his kula dharma on one side according to his kula dharma he should not fight because he has to protect his family and then he has kshatriya dharma the warrior कुल धर्म मीन्स डोंट फाइट क्षत्रिय धर्म मीन्स फाइट सो वॉट शुड यू डू अमॉन्ग दीज टू थिंग्स शुड यू फाइट और शुड यू नॉट फाइट दैट इज अ क्वेश्चन दैट हैज नो इजी आंसर फॉर हिम देर इज गुड ऑन बोथ साइड एंड इज बैड ऑन बोथ साइड गुड ऑन बोथ साइड इज दैट If he does his कुल धर्म हिज प्रोटेक्ट फैमिली इज प्रोटेक्टेड इफ डज क्षत्रिय धर्म हिज किंगडम इज प्रोटेक्टेड His kingdom is protected from unrighteous people, vicious people, in fact. So, what to do? That is a dilemma, and that dilemma can be so crippling. So, for all of us, when we talk about health, oh, sometimes, uh, sometimes just our health goes down because of uh, factors beyond our control. Say, there's a pandemic, and we get infected. You know, there's this, uh, but sometimes, you know, we. may have either misplaced or confused priorities misplaced means that something higher something more important 
we are treating it as less important and something less important we are treating it as more important and confused means we just not sure what is more important what is less important say we have a urgent meeting in our office make or break meeting for our career and that time we come to know that there is some issue with our child in school and the principal has called us now uh, we say obviously i should go to my and be where be there for my child the principal is calling but he said oh but i need my job if i lose my job what will i do so at such a time do i do my duty as a parent first or do i do my duty as a professional first there is no easy way to resolve this and it's not that somebody who decides that no right now this meeting is so important i just cannot leave that doesn't make them a bad person maybe their priorities are misplaced maybe their priorities are confused or maybe it's just not clear in that situation so this is the situation which brings a lot of stress so your mind gets stressed not so much as i said because of having a lot of work to do it is having a lot of unclear or unproductive work to do so if you are doing some hard work you know okay i have to complete this project and i am doing this 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 if you are doing that then the mind is busy we may get tired but we don't feel so stressed we get immersed in it but when you are doing one thing and you think it is should be doing the other thing should be doing this or this that's what that is or that and in that situation the stress becomes far greater much much greater actually so the, how does the gita resolve this stress for arjuna that is the key question and for all of, we, there are many aspects to which we we need to take care of for our health but especially if you don't want inner inner volatility volatility inner fragility inner breakdown then we need not just values values are important but a hierarchy of values values essentially is what we can say what is important that is essentially about values but hierarchy is what is how important so this is important to that this degree that is important to that degree so that is hierarchy of values so we need not just so arjuna had values arjuna was not being cowardly and say i will not fight not once in the bhagavad gita first chapter does arjuna mention that i will that i am afraid of dying that's not what causing hesitation so swa asthita i started with swasthya what the bhagavad gita says is that if we are to be situated in our own situation then that means we need to understand our identity and we need to harmonize our activity with our identity to the extent we are doing like this when these two are taken care of then we are self situated the identity is more in terms of conception who do i think i am hmm? and action in terms more of activity or contribution what am i doing if i say i'm a, i'm a proud patriotic indian and then if i look at my life i have like activities and i'm doing nothing for india mm-hmm. if i say i'm a krishna devotee and i look at my daily schedule and there is nothing that i am no activity connected with krishna that i'm doing then there is a mismatch over there so when our identity and our activity are aligned with who we are that's when we are self situated and that is the state when we can have peace so the whole journey of the bhagavad gita in one sense can be traced in these two activities to restore arjuna to swasthya sthitosmi what arjuna says krishna focuses on helping arjuna to understand his identity and then to align his activity with the identity so now with respect to the question of identity there are there are multiple schools of thought about identity one school of thought is that we have no fixed identity 
that there is nothing unchangeable about us. Everything is just a matter of nurture. So, for example, now and in America, especially and in the Western Canada and the Western world at large, there is this whole issue of uh, transgender, where some people, some people, they just say that you know, I feel like a, a girl may say, I feel like a boy. And then it's within two, three psychological sittings, the psychologists confirm that. And then often these kids, these kids are subjected to irreversible body transforming, body mutilating surgery. So the idea is that you ha we have no intrinsic identity. Uh, we are just who we think we are. Mm -hmm. So if I nurture the idea that I am a girl, a boy may nurture the idea that I am a girl, then the boy becomes a girl. Now there are kids who nurture the idea that I am a cat, I am a monkey. Now are we going to do surgeries to get them to... So, uh, so are we going to do that? Hmm? Obviously it's not possible also. And the other idea is that there is no change in identity possible. That means our identity is determined by nature. So, for example, in the pre-modern societies, a person's identity was more or less determined by their birth. In India, I say if somebody is born in a particular caste, then in a particular family, then that was their identity. You are a weaver, you are a priest, you are a warrior, you are a business person, you are a farmer, like that. And this was not just in India, in the West also it was like that. If somebody was born in nobility, they would be considered nobles. They would be aristocrats. And somebody was born, the I was technical serf for lay people or peasants, whatever. And there was no possibility for a person to change their identity. If you are born in born as a farm worker, that is how you will be throughout your life. So in the past, the debate was much more towards nature. You have no cases for you to change identity. And now it is much more towards nurture. So what the Gita says is that that it is both nature plus nurture. But the Gita says nature refers to not just biological nature but also spiritual nature. And nurture refers to not just present life but also past life. So Gita takes this whole discussion to a much deeper level. So why is the identity important? Because say, going back to the earlier example of say if we are a parent and uh, our child uh, has got some emergency in school. So uh, depending on I, if I identify myself more as a parent and forget the job, I have to go. But if I identify myself more as a professional, okay, then, yeah, you know, maybe somebody, uh, that, that can wait. So, what do we identify ourselves with more? So, Arjuna was confused. Should I identify myself with my Kula, my dynasty, or should I identify with my profession, with my Varna? So, for Arjuna, it was a conflict between Kula or Varna. And Krishna resolves this conflict by saying that the identity is multi-level. That we have many functional identities. And then below that, we have a fundamental identity. So our functional identities may be based on our gender, our education, our nationality, our profession, our, our salary, somebody high, a middle class, upper middle class, lower middle class, like that. So it could be based on our complexion, somebody's fair, dark. It could be height, weight. So we have many identities which are there at a functional level. And each of these identities has its importance. But below these identities is our fundamental identity. And if 
we situate ourselves only in a functional identity ultimately the gita says we cannot be peaceful cause none of the functional identities are permanent all functional identities are temporary so if i identify myself primarily as a parent suppose somebody is i identify as a primarily as a mother and my responsibility to my children is my most important responsibility it's good nowadays parenting is often devalued especially third fourth generation feminism which is often women that you no know, that marriage and motherhood are, are simply traps which will prevent you from growing in your career it's a very distorted understanding life has multiple dimensions so somebody say identifies only with their their role as a parent but then what will happen is it's important to to identify oneself as a parent to take that responsibility but the children will need us much more when say they are newborn when they are babies when they are small children when the children becomes teens when the children become adults but they don't want the parents to be hovering over them all the time i need my space they they may love us but still they need their space so if the children get married and go to their own homes or they have their jobs elsewhere and if once identity is solely as a parent then who am i if i don't have any children to take care of that functional identity as a parent is temporary similarly somebody identifies themselves only as a professional okay i am a software engineer i am a doctor i am lawyer whatever then what happens when sometimes the profession itself goes down sometimes and when some professions are no longer like lucrative sometimes we lose some abilities by which you can do some profession somebody is a surgeon and they they the accident is they lose their hands what are they going to do after that somebody is a sports player and, and they become too old to perform in sports then what is their identity so all functional identities are temporary so for us if we are to be internally peaceful and healthy um, taking care of ourselves so care means that we may identify with our functional identities but it is much more important that we identify with our fundamental identity otherwise ashantasya kutah sukham the functional identities are always flickering so krishna tells us you know what is our fundamental identity is there something to me beyond my gender beyond my bank balance beyond my salary beyond my job beyond my relationships yes krishna says that core that fundamental identity is that we are atma we are souls and the soul doesn't exist in isolation the soul exists in relation the atma is a part of krishna so for us we understand that if that this is our fundamental identity and then we align all our functional identities in relationship with that fundamental identity so i am i am a soul who is a servant of krishna and then in my service to krishna i am a parent in my service to krishna i am a software engineer in my service to krishna i am i am a american i am a indian i am a male i am a female whatever so our fundamental identity becomes the foundation for us and what happens is if we are identifying only with the functional identity say i am here and my one functional identity pulls me in one direction it is pulling me and another functional identity pulling me in the other direction so not just another a different direction but an opposite direction then it's it's just agonizing what should i be doing but if we understand that ultimately all my identities say i am here and all my identities are ultimately meant to link me with krishna so function identity one i am doing this for krishna i am doing this for krishna i am doing this for krishna then if we understand this then what happens for us is there is a harmony in our life and we can decide 
okay, what is more important for my service to Krishna at this particular situation? And accordingly, we make the decision. So what the Gita does is, it starts with a question of identity. It establishes to Arjuna that you are the Atma. And then the question comes up, is it that you just tell somebody you are the soul and it's done? No, each identity, you know, identity has two aspects to it. You know, identity has to be mm, recognized. And then it has to be realized. What is the difference between recognition and realization? That See, our identity is based on a part of who we are. Say, for example, a newborn child, the child doesn't even know the mother exists. It's just some nice soft substance from which something nice juicy comes and I like that. But later on, the child starts understanding, okay, this is, this is my mother. This is a person who loves me. And she's called mama. She's called mother. Um, mom, whatever it is. There's recognition. And then you understand that, okay, I am the child. I recognize it. Okay, I am the child, this is the mother. And then a child means a child needs to act in relationship with that mother. And that means, okay, mother tells me to do this, I should do this. So for us, recognizing we are Atma, this is a matter of philosophy. We study and we understand. But realizing that we are Atma, that is a matter of practice. So then I started about swa-astita. To be self, well situated means that we basically have our identity and our activity in alignment. So how do we do this? Krishna talks about three ways about bringing, of bringing about this alignment with the identity and activity. That is through karma yoga, through bhakti yoga and through jnana yoga. And these correspond to the three main divisions of the Bhagavad Gita. And all three, in one sense, are meant for one purpose. If you want to understand the Gita's flow, say, say this is a bull's eye. Somehow I don't like the word bull's eye. Such a brutal image, right? It's like bullseye says it's the target. So why do you want to hurt a bull? And why do you hurt a bull in the eye? If somebody says, I'm going to shoot you, I'm going to shoot you in the eye. You know, shooting in the eye doesn't kill, but um, it hurts terribly. The eye is a very vulnerable part of our body. So in the past, it was, uh, life was much more brutal in many ways. So, but anyway, let's use the word bullseye. We use a simple target. So if somebody can hit that target with an arrow, no, they're expert. But if somebody is really expert, they can hit the target not only from the front, but they're at an angle and from there also they hit the target. From another angle also they hit the target. And that will require a lot of expertise. So Krishna has one purpose in the Bhagavad Gita. And that is to guide Arjuna out of his confusion. And that, so that is the target. That is the bullseye. And Krishna hits the target in multiple ways. He hits the target by analyzing through karma yoga, by analyzing through jnana yoga, and by analyzing through bhakti yoga. Through all of these, he brings the Gita to the same conclusion. Now, I won't go into all three of these modes of analysis. In detail. But let's put it this way. That the Gita actually has a slightly more sophisticated way of understanding. So, it is like, so as I said, one understanding is that the Gita has first six chapters are about Karma Yoga. Hmm. The next six chapters are about Bhakti Yoga. The next six chapters are about Jnana Yoga. That's, that's a fair enough understanding. But there is a more precise understanding you can see. 
that actually if you consider karma yoga to be here, jnana yoga to be here, bhakti yoga to be here. So how it is is that the Gita in the first six chapters about going from karma yoga to bhakti yoga. In the last six chapters, it talks about going from Gyan Yoga to Bhakti Yoga. And in the middle six chapters, it's simply describing Bhakti Yoga. And it describes Bhakti Yoga itself at multiple levels. So, the whole point of the Gita is, Krishna is not starting off the Gita to explain Karma Yoga, to explain Bhakti Yoga, to explain Gyan Yoga to Arjuna. See, for example, if somebody has cancer, now, we may offer them, if we are doctors, we may offer them multiple treatments. They say, we may tell them, okay, this is, this, you can do chemo, chemotherapy, you can do natural therapy, you can do this therapy, that therapy. Now, at that time, our purpose is not to give them an exhaustive explanation of chemotherapy or radiotherapy or natural, thera natural therapy or whatever. Our purpose is to give them that knowledge which will help them Treat their disease. So when somebody has got cancer, they don't have to be given a, given a course material that will expect them to do PhD in chemotherapy. That's not at all required or relevant. But similarly, Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita is not starting off with the purpose, okay, I'm going to teach Karma Yoga, I'm going to teach Bhakti Yoga, I'm going to teach Gyan Yoga. So he's addressing Arjuna's dilemma. And in addressing Arjuna's dilemma, Krishna outlines various processes as means to address his dilemma. So let's see how he does it. So the Atma, the idea that we are souls can be realized in different ways. And among various processes, Krishna says that the Bhakti Yoga is the highest. Why? Because Bhakti Yoga brings us to the full level of Swastha, Swastitaha. Because we are not just souls. We are souls in relationship with Krishna. And Karma Yoga helps us to realize that we are souls. Jnana Yoga also helps us to realize we are souls. But these processes in themselves don't help us to realize that we are also eternal parts of Krishna meant to be in a loving relationship with him. That is what Bhakti Yoga alone does. And that's why Bhakti Yoga is like the fullest therapy. Sometimes some medicine, some treatment, it says, okay, you're in the hospital, you will get free from the infection, but then after that you go to convales a convalescent home. Then you go somewhere in a peaceful place and you, we will remove the infection from your body, but the body's recovery of natural strength that, that you have to do somewhere else. You go somewhere else and do it. So like that, what Karma Yoga and Gyan Yoga, they do is, they remove misidentification. Hmm? That's like, that's like removing germs, removing infection from the body. And that's important, that's essential for health. But Bhakti Yoga, what it does is, it removes misidentification but it also restores real identification. Restores our real identity for us. That's like recuperation, recuperating health, recuperating our vitality. So, okay, the germs are removed, but still the body is weak. You go to some convalescent home, then you recover over there. So Bhakti Yoga does both. And Bhakti Yoga alone does both. And that is why Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita emphasizes Bhakti Yoga so much. So coming back to the context, of the, I'll make two more points and then we can have a few questions. That in the Gita, what Krishna does is that Krishna tells Arjuna that there are many things, many ways in which he could decide what he's supposed to do. As he can say, is this Kula Dharma important? Is Kshatriya Dharma important? Is this your highest Dharma is your Sanatan Dharma, is your eternal function. Eternal function is that you are my part, your soul. And that's why 1866 is about this. Sarva Dharman Parityajya Maam Ekam Sharanam Rajan. 
So maam ekam sharanam. Surrender to me alone. Now that does not mean that all the other dharmas are rejected. Now the way Arjuna surrenders to Krishna is by fighting the war. So like earlier I said that here, if you go back, that our functional identity is used to help, help us connect with Krishna, to help us act according to our fundamental identity. So, in that particular situation, Krishna tells Arjuna that you are meant to serve me. So, your Sanatan Dharma is best performed in this particular situation through your Kshatriya Dharma. Hmm. Let me say, for example, in our moment when the book description was very emphasized, even now it's emphasized. The book description was very emphasized. At that time, some of the temple leaders told devotees that, that just even young mothers, they were told, just go out and distribute books. And there was one common caretaker for all the small children in the community. And that one person would take care and everybody, all other young mothers would also go to distribute books. And then Prabhu, when Prabhupada came to know about it, Prabhupada said, no. He said, you are, your children are not ordinary children. They are like Vaikuntha children. You should take care of them. Taking care of children is as important as worshipping the deities, if not more. So Prabhupada said that in this, you may be a book distributor, you are a mother. So your Sanatan Dharma, your role as a devotee can be performed much better as a mother than as a book distributor at that particular time. There may be other times when yeah, you, you can serve Krishna better as a book distributor. So there can be other times when Krishna, Arjuna could have served Krishna better by doing the school of dharma. So now when we do one duty for Krishna, does that mean, say when Arjuna is doing his Kshatriya dharma, is he neglecting his school of dharma? It's not neglecting, it is subordinating. Krishna tells Arjuna that you are thinking that, that uh, if I fight, if I do my Kshatriya dharma, if I fight, I have to, I have to kill my relatives. I have to shoot arrows at Bhishma and Drona and they will be, how can I cause them such pain? How can I be the cause of their death? And Krishna tells Arjuna, you are seeing externally. Just as you are not seeing your identity, you are not seeing their identity also. They are souls. And you are thinking, Bhish, you are thinking Bhishma's plight. His plight is painful situation because of your physical arrows. When you shoot it at them. That will, this will shoot if you fight. But Krishna says that actually what is true is his plight is because of Duryodhana's verbal arrows. No. Duryodhana is constantly suspecting and taunting Bhishma. He says, you know, you are partial to the Pandavas. You are not dedicated enough to my cause. You are not fighting to their full potential. And for a Kshatriya, this is extremely difficult to bear. The idea that their, their character is questioned, their commitment is questioned. So, the, those Duryodhana's verbal arrows are far more painful and he has to bear those arrows because you are, because you are, because he's obligated to fight on the side of the Duryodhana. But if you fight then he will be liberated from that situation. And once he's liberated from that situation, because he's a virtuous soul, because he's a devoted soul, he will be elevated and he will go to a better destination. So even your Kula Dharma, your concern for Bhishma, that will also be addressed if you serve me. And when Arjuna understand this, so Sarva Dharma and Paritaja doesn't mean that give up all Dharma and become Adharmic. It means take up that dharma which is in alignment with our Sanatan dharma, which is that dharma which enables us to do Mahamekam Sharanam Raja. And this way when we understand that we are in harmony with Krishna. Say so in, in life, there are things which are in our control. And th so there are some things in our control. And there are things which are 
beyond our control. So dharma has both these aspects. For the things that are in our control, there is diligence. We take up responsibility and we those do, do those duties very wholeheartedly. As Arjuna did when he chose to fight with uh, fight on behalf of Krishna. But along with that, there is dependence. For the things beyond our control, there is dependence. And this <coughs> is the understanding that will bring us peace of mind. That will, that, we, that will situate us in who we actually are. And that is how we will actually become peaceful. Peaceful not just by expecting the removal of outer conflict, but peaceful by aligning ourselves with who we really are. So Krishna has a big plan for the world. And in Krishna's plan, I have also a place. So let me do my part in Krishna's plan and Krishna will take care of other things. It is this understanding, this inner conception that will actually situate us in sound health and peacefulness and confidence as Arjuna was situated at the end of the Bhagavad Gita. So I'll summarize. I said that the Bhagavad Gita can be approached in many different ways. One way is we approach it as a guidebook for swasthya, swa-asthitaha. How we can be situated in our natural positions. Arjuna was physically and emotionally dysfunctional at the end of the Gita. So from 1.30 to 1873 is a journey towards health through harmony. Harmony in the sense of Arjuna becomes aligned with who he really is. And in that connection, second point I discussed was how Gita talks about our identity as multi-level identity. So we have many functional identities. Below that, we have a fundamental identity. And our functional identities are temporary. Our fundamental identity is one and eternal. This functional identity is multiple. So if we, I, we need to, to actually be peacefully situated, we need to stop identifying with our functional identities first. First, identify our fundamental identity. And then that our fundamental identity is we are souls. We are parts of Krishna. And we are meant to align with Krishna and use all our functional identities to align with Krishna. And the third part I talked about is the from identity, activity, harmony. So that means there are three ways. The activities is Karma Yoga, Gyan Yoga, Bhakti Yoga. And among these, the Bhakti Yoga is most recommended because uh, Bhakti Yoga doesn't just help us like in treatment, removing infections. It like removes misidentification, but it also restores health. It helps a person to recuperate. It restores us in our, it re, uh, to our, in our real identity as parts of Krishna. And the last part I discuss based on that is that to be situated rightly, that means to understand our role, our place in Krishna's bigger plan. So for our role, there is diligence. We work wholeheartedly. And for the bigger situation, there is dependence. And it is this state of mind, which is the state of emotional health based on spiritual realignment with who we are. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions or comments? Hare Krishna, dear devotees. No. You may raise your hand if you have any specific questions or any comments. Thank you so much for the beautiful Katha Prabhu. Uh, it, was, it was so nectarian, uh, especially the functional identities and fundamental identities. I myself can feel that like I have now my Atma. So identification itself is very beautiful. Um, I realized it uh, with your classes yesterday, today. Thank you so much for all your Kathas from last two days. Pujula Mataji, you may take over Mataji. Thank you, Chaitanya Chaitanya Thank you so very much. That inner settlement for individual harmony as we walk together in this journey of bhakti. And the summary that you do at the end of your kathas is unparalleled, Prabhu. 
And now that I think you're using um, this handwritten one, we feel like we are writing the notes, but the notes is at the best as it is coming from you. Thank you so much. Yes, dear devotees, thank you, Prabhu. Rundavaneshwari Mataji, you can talk now. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, Dandavat Pranam. You talked about like uh, the Karma Yoga and Jnana Yoga, they help in removing the misidentity. And Bhakti Yoga establishes our real identity. Whereas uh, Jnana Yoga talks about Nitya, Nitya Viveka, and then the, uh, in that knowledge, in that light, we can understand like we are Atmans. But kindly elaborate, how can we understand it through Karma Yoga? How does Karma Yoga help us realize our identity? Well, through Karma Yoga, basically, when we work with detachment, what happens is that we start realizing that we are, that we have a core that exists beyond our identities, beyond our functional identities. And... <clears throat> In the process of functioning with detachment, it's like an actor is playing a role on a drama stage. And if that actor is very attached to the applause or the accolades or the wealth that is going to come thereafter, and the actor is constantly thinking about that role. But the actor does that role, but the actor is not too attached to that. So I like, okay, yeah, this is actually a stage and I'm playing this role, but I am, I'm different from that role. So similarly for us, what detachment does is, this is the, if you consider this is a soul, this is the mind, this is the body. And detachment basically helps us it increases the distance between the soul and the mind. It increases the distance between the mind and the body. And thereby, we are able to see these parts of, our, parts of us as different from us. And that's how it helps us realize. Now, both Jnana Yoga and Karma Yoga, they aim for the same process. So Jnana Yoga, Karma Yoga works more through action. And Jnana Yoga works more through contemplation. Now the Vivek is also awakened through Karma Yoga also. The Buddhi is developed through detachment. So the idea is that this, we don't necessarily have to give up activity to realize our higher, to realize, to progress towards realizing our identity. And like somebody may say, I won't participate in this drama at all. But somebody can participate in that drama, but they have a little bit more dispassion. They have a little more det detachment. And slowly they start saying, yeah, there is more to life than just the way I'm moving my hands and the way I'm laughing and the way people are clapping. Something bigger than all gone over here. That's how we realize it. Okay. Yes, Nitya Mataji. Um, Hare Krishna. Uh, I... I have one question. Um, so you said that we should determine the best method of service and then follow that method of service. Who um, tells us what the best method of service is? Like for Arjuna Krishna told him that the, the best way to serve me is to actually fight in my service. Who tells us what our best um, method of service is? Well, even for uh, Arjuna, Krishna did not really... Uh, tell throughout the Gita that Krishna, Krishna's purpose was not just to uh, give Arjuna a decision. It, if that's what Arjuna wanted, Krishna wanted to do, Krishna could have just told Arjuna in six words. I am God, obey me, fight. Bhagavad Gita over. Krishna's purpose in speaking the Gita was not to give a decision. It was to train Arjuna in decision making. And that's why he went through 700 verses. That was the purpose, but that was the more important. The more important purpose was train in decision making. And for us also, we can 
we can connect with the guru we can have seen a devotee to guide us but the purpose of a guru the purpose of a counselor the purpose of a mentor the purpose of a guide is not to for, to make us dependent on them as disciples uh, or as followers we always feel dependent on the guidance and mercy and blessings of seniors but the success of their blessings their their mercy their guidance is that we learn we become trained in the process of decision making and we make decisions so yes initially we do consult senior devotees but over a period of time we learn to use our god given intelligence and for major decisions we can always consult senior devotees but afterwards it is for us to decide how best we can serve krishna and there are broad guidelines which are given say if we consider this is the range of activities that we do so there are some which are we could say white in the sense that they are fully recommended activities and there are some which are wrong which are which are unhealthy activities which are to be given up and then to the extent we we do what is known what is known to be good for us and we avoid that which is known to be bad for us then so this you can say this is white this is black and all this in the middle is a gray zone so what is the gray will slowly become clearer with time if we align with the white and we avoid the black so black and white we generally learn from our spiritual guides we hear classes and we understand from there and then after that specifics we learn thereafter through inner revelation through experience through maturity Prabhupada in the eleventh in the introduction of the Act of Instruction says that once we come to the mode of goodness, then how to advance further is revealed from within. Okay. Yes, Krishna Priya Mataji. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Please accept my obeisances. All glories to Sri Prabhupada. Um, I wanted to thank you for the very nice um, class that you gave today. And my reflection is, is that one that you are addressing the audience that you're speaking with. And this is very important that I was appreciating that you, although you might be in a different ashram in life, at the same time, you're aware of the different um, priorities and difficulties that people have to face in their life. So I was really appreciating how you were giving, um, you know, practical guidance from Bhagavad Gita, from Shastra, of making different different points. And one point that I really appreciated, having come from the um, the old days in Iskhan, when you brought up that point about Prabhupada said, you know, that for the mothers, taking care of your children is like the deity worship. And so sometimes in the beginning stage of one's devotional life, they will feel so much enthusiasm, which is natural. And they want to take up the manobi stum, the inner desire of the spiritual master and to spread Krishna consciousness all over the world. But sometimes um, there has to be, like you were stressing, that we have to know what our priorities are and that at different times we have a different service. So I was really appreciating that book time, that point you brought up that at one time you have a particular service and that Krishna has a plan. And, you know, those children that have been given to you, they are not ordinary children. And that's, that's a very sacred um, service. And how you treat those children, how you raise those children, how you, if you treat them like an ashram, then they can grow up and do probably a lot better service than the generation before. But if you neglect the children, then that causes, you know, there it's actually offenses and it causes great difficulty. So I was just very, very much appreciating that you brought up that point that at different times in our devotional service, we'll have different services to do. And that, um, and if we do those services nicely, then we can, go on to other things when the time is right. And I also really appreciated your point about the upadis very much too, because if I'm identifying, all right, my identity is just 
you know, then I'm a mother. Then when my children go away, it's the empty nest syndrome. Or if I identify like once I was the temple president here, if I identify, oh, I'm the temple president, I'm Miss New Galoka, then when I'm no longer the temple president, then I have no identity. So I was just appreciating that point that what is our identity? Our identity is we're the nature of our soul is meant to serve and Krishna will reveal to us. So I, I just want to tell you, I really um, appreciate it. I'm not usually on this forum, but Ujala had posted it. And so I thought I would just sort of jump on and, and participate. So thank you so much. Thank you, Anthony. Happy to do your service. Yes, it's a, the Prabhupada's own example is there. Prabhupada, when he met Bhakti Sanskrit Thakur for the first time, no, he said that if I had not been married, I would have immediately joined the ashram. But now I had a wife, I had a, I had a child. It would have been un- Prabhupada, it would have been unfair to them if I had if I had left at that time. So Prabhupada also considered his responsibility as important. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Mother Priya, thank you so much for bringing that point. And uh, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, we specifically thank you for that specific point as Krishna Priya Mataji mentioned, because uh, that is the driving force for this wholesome devotee care thing, to better understand bhakti, and as you both were saying, to um, prioritize the service according to time, place, circumstance, the ashram we are in, so we can practice bhakti in harmony. If there is no harmony and peace uh, in bhakti, the steadiness will be too far. So I think that point really defines the whole thing, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. And if you would like to say a few words about that, um, you know, bhakti in harmony by addressing all these aspects of health, how that would take us further in bhakti. And after that, we will close this uh, session, Prabhu. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'll make one point about that. See, there's a question about how does one carry out Sanatana Dharma if a particular duty does not align with our inclinations. I think, again, it's a matter of time. Like, we may be inclined toward higher studies, but we have family responsibilities. Well, there are... We live in a world whose structure is very different from what was in the past. So in the past, the people would be born in families where they would naturally have inclinations. That's the ideal world and ashram system. Well, now it's not. Sometimes we have to adjust... At a particular phase in my life, I focus on a particular duty. Later on, I may do some other duty. Even in the temple, somebody is living in the temple, in the ashram. Sometimes a project needs a particular service. Somebody may be more inclined towards uh, studying Shastra and teaching Shastra. But if a particular time requires that, okay, we have our temple is in a big crisis. We have to raise some funds now. We have to build a temple. Then that's what we need to do. Giriraj Maha tells the story about how Prabhupada told him to write, but then they were doing a big pandal program. And at that time, Giraj Maharaj, he was Giraj Prabhu at that time, he wanted to write, but Shamsandar Prabhu said, right now, we want to do this pandal program. So he says that you can write any time, but right now we have an opportunity to approach influential people and ask them for contributions and we have a reason they will give. Later on, we will not be able to ask. So he said that he talked with Prabhupada and Prabhupada says, yes. That service is important right now. You, you do it that now. So that way, I think uh, time is also a factor. Rather than thinking that we can't do what is according to our inclinations, you can say, okay, maybe I can't do it right now. Let's wait. We don't grow only by doing something according to our inclinations. We may also grow by learning a mode of service, attitude, and sacrifice. We have to do something which is important at that particular time. And just to conclude this point, See, there, are, there is one conception of bhakti that this is the spiritual world, this is the material world. And bhakti means that we turn away from the material world and go toward Krishna. This is one understanding of bhakti. Krishna exists in the spiritual world and the material world is simply a place of distress. But another understanding of bhakti is that, that Krishna pervades both the material and the spiritual world. Krishna mentions this in 1846 to 48. He says, 
so we that 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 from that being from whom the whole world emanates and from that being by whom the whole world is pervaded we serve that being by are working by working in a mode of worship so we could say that there is immersive devotion immersive bhakti where we turn away from the world to focus on krishna directly that is the time for our sadhana that is the time for our puja for our um, for uh, for direct devotional activities and there is a time for inclusive bhakti inclusive bhakti, immersive bhakti is we turn away from the world toward krishna inclusive bhakti is we understand that the world is also included in krishna's jurisdiction krishna doesn't exist only in the temple krishna exists in our home krishna exists in our workplace and we serve krishna through our various activities in the world so there is ideally speaking we seek a healthy balance between immersive bhakti and inclusive bhakti so immersive bhakti in terms of time it will always be lesser it will be for a few hours a day or whatever and inclusive bhakti will be more in time but what will immersive bhakti and inclusive bhakti both of them can nourish each other so when we immerse ourselves in krishna that gives that gives us inner stability that i am grounded in something unchanging and then we can face the changes of the world with greater step with a greater maturity with greater cl- clarity and inclusive bhakti it gives us a sense of value of productivity we are in this world and we would like to do some things in the world it is if somebody tells us you know okay from tomorrow you are no responsible just chant 64 rounds or 108 128 rounds every day we might love to do it for a couple of days or somebody says just read bhagavatam or just do kirtans for 6 hours 8 hours 10 hours we might like that but after some time we'll want to do some more thing what more can i do so we want a, a sense that i want to do something productive in this world also and when we see actually by my bhakti i can do my role as a parent better i am more calmer i am more caring i am more responsible by my bhakti i can actually my mind is calmer and my mind is clearer and i can do my job better but that in, inspires us to immerse ourselves in bhakti also in 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 in, in practicing immersive bhakti so immersive and inclusive bhakti both can be harmonized in this way thank you very much hare krishna